This is a 2019 Chevy Corvette ZR1, and it is, quite simply, the craziest Corvette in history. Up here is a supercharged 6.2 liter V8 that makes 755 horsepower and 715 pound-feet of torque. This car does 0 to 60 in 3.1 seconds. It'll do 211 miles an hour. This one cost just a shade over $140,000. But then, if you're into cars even slightly, you probably know all that. Today, I'm going to show you the rest. I've borrowed this ZR1 from a viewer near Annapolis, Maryland, and he has his own YouTube channel called DHR Street Speed. You can check it out with a link in the description below. And frankly, you should check it out, because in addition to this ZR1, he also has a ZL1, a Dodge Demon, a Jeep Trackhawk, an old Mustang GT500, and a Viper. It's quite a collection. But today, we're focusing on the ZR1. First, a little history. Now, the ZR1 originally came out on the third generation Corvette in the 1960s, and Chevy has made it on and off ever since, and over time it has come to signify the ultimate Corvette in the lineup. But this is the ultimate Corvette in history. It has more power than any Lamborghini Aventador. It has the same top speed as a Ferrari 812 Superfast, and it has more torque than a Lexus LFA. In fact, it has double the torque of a Lexus LFA, plus some more. So today I'm going to take you on a tour of the ZR1, and I'm going to show you all of the interesting quirks and features of the ultimate Corvette. Then I'm going to get behind the wheel and get it out on the road, which I'm already a little scared about, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the ZR1, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer, where I've also compiled a list of the cheapest Corvettes currently listed for sale on Autotrader. Now, we start back here with the wing, because this wing is one of the largest I've ever seen mounted on any street-legal automobile. In fact, if you look closely, you'll see there's the regular Corvette bodywork, then on top of that, there's a little rear spoiler, and then this rear spoiler is mounted on the other rear spoiler, so this car basically has two. The large one is absolutely huge, and it comes as part of the performance package. Interestingly, you can choose two different wing options. You can have this one if you're serious about racetrack use, or you can get the low wing if you just want a stealthier ZR1, which also gives it a higher top speed since it reduces drag. But how could you not get this? Now, one of the most interesting things about this wing is what it does to the cargo area. I'm going to start with the hatch itself. Take a look at the hatch opening with the wing back there. You can see the wing was clearly designed with the hatch in mind. It only clears it by a quarter of an inch, basically enough for you to clear the hatch and get a little finger in there. And that's about it. Now, a couple of other interesting things about the hatch because of this wing. One is simply loading stuff in the back of this car. The wing comes up like nine inches off the already high load floor, and so you just can't load stuff from the direct rear of this car like you can in every other car. Basically, everything you load into the back of the ZR1 has to be from the sides, which is odd. If you want to take this car to go golfing, for example, you'll have to load in your golf clubs from over the wheel, but such is the price you pay to have the monster wing. Another thing that's interesting about the rear wing and the cargo area, because it's difficult to actually get your hand in there to close the tailgate because of how close the tailgate is to the rear wing, Chevy has made the tailgate in this car soft closed. In other words, if you just kind of close it most of the way, the ZR1 will automatically close it the rest of the way so you don't have to fumble around trying to get your hand under the wing to slam it down in place. That is a good, well thought design. Design. Next, I'm moving around to the front. Now, like I mentioned, that wing is part of the performance package, which is a $2,995 option. The performance package also includes sport suspension and special sports summer tires, but my favorite performance package item is right here. It's these little end caps on the front splitter. Now, the front splitter itself is crazy, but the end caps make it even look crazier and more aggressive, and my favorite part is that they cover up part of the reflector that's mandated by federal regulation. You get a normal Corvette, you get the full-size reflector. You get a ZR1 with the performance pack, you don't need that full-size reflector crap. You're better than that, and it hides half the reflector. 
Next up, we get to a couple of other unique ZR1 exterior items that need to be mentioned, starting with the side skirts, which are carbon fiber. They have a very cool look to them, but also the other interesting thing about them is they sort of curve in about halfway through. That's so that when you're getting out of the car, you don't accidentally step on them, and that little curve in prevents you from damaging them. Now, such a concern for damage was not given to the front splitter, which is also unique to the ZR1. It is carbon fiber, it is huge, and it is very low. I hope Chevrolet builds a large stockpile of these front splitters because I strongly suspect a lot of ZR1 owners are going to take them off and scrape them up on low curbs and driveways. Another interesting exterior item on the ZR1 would be the hood. In my opinion, the hood is the craziest part of the outside of this car, aside from the rear wing, of course. Just take a look at it. From that angle, you can see where the normal Corvette hood would be, and then you can see where the ZR1 hood is. It sticks up like an additional four inches beyond that, just because this engine and its supercharger is so massive. But that's not the best part. The best part is when you open the hood. That's because when you open up the hood in this car, well, there's a hole in it. This car has a hole in its hood. Allow me to explain. Now, the prior generation ZR1 came out in 2009, and that was just when that trend was getting started of having glass covers over the hood so you could see the engine from the outside of the car. Now, Chevy decided to get in on that trend with the last generation ZR1, so they placed a little glass cover on the hood so you could see into the engine. Unfortunately, the part that you saw in the engine looked like a plastic piece, and it was a very small glass cover, and everybody kind of made fun of the old ZR1 for it. Now, I talked to some some engineers and designers of the new ZR1 when it was revealed, and you could tell there was still a little sensitivity at being teased about that glass window, and so this car forgoes the glass treatment, and instead this piece in the middle, the one that stays put when the rest of the hood opens up, that's actually the engine. Instead of having a cover so you can look at the engine, this car has the actual engine right here always on display. That's the top of the supercharger. And so, yeah, in a Ferrari you can look in and see the engine, but in this car you can touch it. And that's kind of cool. But as cool as that is, there are some interesting issues that go along with having the engine and the supercharger stick up so high. One of them is the fact that in Europe, all cars must have a little inch or two buffer between the hood and the hard parts on the engine, so that if the car hits a pedestrian, when they hit the top of the car and the hood, there's some cushion before they hit the hard stuff in the engine. Unfortunately, the top of this hood is the engine, so by designing the car this way, Chevy basically had to concede that they would never sell any of these in Europe. The other issue with the supercharger and the engine coming up so high is visibility from the front seat. Take a look at what it looks like when you're sitting in there. You can see this actually blocks visibility. Even the little ZR1 badge on either side of the engine on the hood actually blocks your vision ever so slightly. I've never seen a situation before where an emblem blocked your vision. Next, we move on to the cargo area, and you'll notice at first glance it's surprisingly large back here. There's not a lot of 700 plus horsepower cars with this much cargo room. One interesting item in the cargo area is the cargo covers, which are rather unusual. Instead of a retractable cargo cover like you might get in a hatchback, your typical Volkswagen Golf, this has sort of two covers that have to be installed, one for the front part of the cargo area and one for the rear part of the cargo area. They're a little bit cumbersome, they're not that easy, but I guess you should be happy that your cargo is covered at all in a 700 plus horsepower sports car. Also interesting back here is an item that the ZR1s are delivered with, and that would be these little foam protectors for the brake rotor. When you remove the wheels and tires for this car to change to put on your track tires, for example, you're supposed to put those little protectors on. Now, in 50 years at the Pebble Beach auctions, I suspect the ZR1s that bring in the most money will be the cars that have like zero miles on them. They were never driven, the tires and wheels were never removed, and those foam protectors were never taken out of their giant Ziploc bag, but that won't be this car. I say that because the owner of this car is one of my favorite car owners I've met while filming these videos, largely because he drives his cars and uses them considerably. He has a racing license, he goes to the drag strip, even though he owns a lot of cars that a lot of people are putting away in storage units tightly sealed up to save with no miles so that one day they'll make be worth $250,000 at Barrett Jackson. But that isn't his attitude, and that's proven by the fact that right above the gear lever he has a little plaque that says, built in Bowling Green, Kentucky, USA, and it has his name on it. And I said, 
they, you know, when you go to sell this thing, people are going to say, you know, you devalued the car, you got your name there, the next guy's not going to want it as much. And he looked at me and said, I don't care about the next guy. And that's exactly the attitude that I appreciate most with cars like this. You don't want to store them away and never let anyone drive them, like, for example, a Ferrari Enzo. Now, I should mention, it's not like the owner of this car made that little plaque himself. That's an option that Chevrolet offers to the ZR1 customers, and it is surprisingly cheap. I'm looking here on the window sticker and the personalized plaque with name and VIN, so it's every different car is unique. They gotta make one for each vehicle. It costs only $200. That seems like a deal. If this thing were a Porsche, that would be like a $1,900 option. One item that was expensive, how about $5,000 for the custom selectable VIN. I asked Dave, did he choose this VIN specifically? He just asked for the lowest possible VIN. That is a pretty penny. And since we're talking window sticker, take a look at this one. This car starts at 118.9, which is a reasonable bargain. This one has $24,000 in options. Interestingly, they've included the gas guzzler tax in there as an option. If I was getting a ZR1, I would I would not get that option. Uh, but anyway, the total cost of the car comes out to $143,995, which probably makes this the most expensive Corvette ever. But anyway, moving on from the window sticker, I'm gonna show you some of the other quirks and features inside the ZR1. Now it's worth noting, I did a review of the Corvette Z06 and I covered a lot of this stuff. So I'm gonna skip over a lot of what I covered in the Z06 review. I'll cover the, some of the same highlights. Of course, I've also found some interesting new quirks and features and spending a little bit more time with this car, but I'm gonna start with the doors. Now to get out of a Corvette, most people don't know this, but there's not a door handle. You push a little button and it's an electronic release and it lets you out. But what happens if you're driving along and you're battery dies, well, they have a manual release on the floor and the driver footwell or the passenger footwell. I really like the manual releases in these Corvette. It's like hieroglyphs. The first one kind of shows what you're supposed to do with your finger, and then the next one shows a person getting out of the car, and then the last one shows that you can read more about this in the owner's manual. Next, we must discuss the heads-up display. Now, a lot of General Motors vehicles, and a lot of vehicles in general now, have a heads-up display that sort of projects vital information onto the windshield in front of the driver so you don't have to look down at the gauge cluster when you're driving. The weird thing in this car is it projects it like directly into that hood bump. So the heads up display is like competing for visibility with that hood bump and it kind of makes it difficult to read the heads up display. But I mean, do you want the giant supercharger or not? These are the kind of things you have to deal with. Next up, you can see the ZR1 has an infotainment system, which is no surprise. All cars do. This one is a touch screen. The unusual thing about it is that well, you can lower it, press the little screen button, and then the screen sort of drops down and reveals a hidden storage compartment behind the infotainment screen. Police officers pulling over Corvettes, something to think about, hmm? And how can we discuss the interior of this car without discussing the single weirdest heated seat and cooled seat button set up in the entire car industry? The driver's seat has a button for its heated seat and a button for its cool seat, no surprise. The passenger side, that button is over on the far right, over by the furthest air vent near the door. There's a heated seat button and a cooled seat button, but strangely enough, there's also a heated seat button and a cooled seat button in the middle in the center console on the passenger side, so the passenger has two different places they can go to turn on their heated seat or their cooled seat. You sit in the passenger seat in a Corvette and you are bathed in luxury with heated and cooled seat buttons basically everywhere you touch. Next up, another interesting thing in this car, this vehicle has an eight-speed automatic, and you know that because it says eight-speed on the top of the gear lever. My question, of course, is why? Do you think people are gonna be sitting here driving people around their zero one going, yeah, I got an eight-speed. Yeah, yeah, I, I got an eight speed, you just got a seven speed, but I got eight, so pretty cool. Next up, moving on to some of the screen stuff. Probably my favorite thing is the fact that it shows engine hours and revs. Not a lot of cars show that. Most cars just show your odometer, but in this one you can tell, well, how long the engine has been running, and apparently how much it has revved. I also like the various different display themes in the gauge cluster, and check out track. Tell me that just doesn't look cool. I mean, that looks like you're really a track-focused, hardcore driver. 
in your ZR1, which frankly, a lot of people who buy these probably will be. Next up, moving on to the center infotainment screen. This car has a performance data recorder, like a lot of performance cars. Basically, you can tell it to start your lap and stop your lap, and it'll tell you how fast you went and give you other various readouts. The interesting thing about this one is it has a camera. The camera is built in up here, and it points out, and you can actually re-watch your old laps, in addition to also getting the performance readouts and that kind of thing, and that's sort of cool. But the coolest thing about the camera is you can use it in valet mode. In fact, there's a little setting that lets you automatically have it go on when you put the car in valet mode, and that way you can always monitor what valets are doing when you're giving them your ZR1 for a night on the town. I also like that this car has various different apps, like any GM vehicle, frankly, with this MyLink infotainment system, but it's a little bit odd. You go into weather, for instance, and it gives you like a three-day forecast, or you can see a five-day forecast, and you can put in a place, and it will tell you what the weather is going to be in that place and give you an hourly forecast and a five-day forecast. In other words, you're driving a 750 horsepower car that will give you a five-day weather forecast. That's the world we're living in now. Anybody who says cars are getting boring, well, I don't think so, but they are getting more informative. Next up, a couple of interesting settings in the infotainment system. One is in the navigation settings. You can tell the car to avoid ferries or tolls or whatever. That's pretty standard. You can also tell it to avoid slow traffic. Who would turn that off? If you use a navigation system, yeah, I want to avoid slow traffic. There are, there are people who are out there like, you know, I want to go right into the heart of the slow traffic. I want to know what that's like. Another interesting item in the infotainment system is there is a teen driver mode. I suspect you can limit the speed or something like that, or at least maybe limit the horsepower output when you give the car to your teen driver. It seems odd to have a 750 horsepower car with a teen driver mode, but at least it gives you that option if, as a parent, you feel your 17-year-old is ready for a ZR1. Next up, another interesting item in the infotainment system, that would be the number of radio favorites you can set it to display. Most cars display six, eight, maybe ten radio presets. This car, you can get pretty high. My question is, who really wants it to go that high? Are there people out there going, you know, 44 just isn't enough. I need to see 46 of my favorite radio channels at all times. And one other interesting item, this car has a remote starter. You can start it from, for example, if you're walking up to it in your driveway and you want it to start heating or cooling before you get inside. One cool thing about the remote starter, there's a setting in here that lets you configure whether the car will remote start the heated seats or the cooled seats based on the exterior temperature. So if you're walking up to the car on a very warm day and you have that pressed, the car will start cooling your seat before you even get inside, which is a very luxurious feature. Next up, moving back to the outside of the ZR1, one interesting item about this car is that they also sell a convertible version. Now, this is the fourth generation ZR1. There was one in the 60s, there was one in the 80s, the one in the 2000s, and then this one, and they've never offered a convertible before, but they are now on this one. Now, the interesting thing about that is this is a convertible. This panel right here lifts out, and there's a place in back where you can stow it for a nice sunny day to enjoy your ZR1 experience. Now, I demonstrated that in my Z06 video, which is linked below, so I'm not going to show you again, but trust me, it lifts out and it only weighs 16 pounds. But for those of you who don't believe that a lift-out roof panel is the full convertible experience, you can get a true soft-top ZR1. Next up, another little detail I find kind of interesting about the ZR1, you open the door of this 750 horsepower, 210 mile an hour supercar, and you see there's a little decal on there from the local 2164 United Auto Workers at the Bowling Green, Kentucky plant. I promise you a Ferrari 488 does not have a decal like that. And speaking of the local 2164, let's see how those people made this thing sound. <laughs> and features of the ZR1, and now it's time to get it out on the road and see how the ultimate Corvette drives. Oh, this is exciting. God, look at that hood bulge. I mean, that's that's a, quite a hood bulge. The one benefit with that wing, even though you can actually, you can see it in the camera like it's blocking me, but actually it's not. I can, I look back there and it's totally out of my field of vision. Man, the ride is harsh. <laughs> Just a couple bumps, it's like, whew. Oh, the sound is amazing. It sounds like a supercar, but there's some American muscle in there too. But the sound is really good. <laughs> I 
<laughs> Man, that sound is really, really cool. The gear changes are not as instantaneous as they are in dual clutch cars. It's just sort of reality when you pay 140 and not 340. But you're still doing zero to 60 in 3.1, so probably shouldn't be complaining. The ride quality is harsh. Even going over just sort of like minor things in the pavement, you can tell you're feeling stuff. However, I'm also sitting here. I got to just turn on my cooled seat. I got the climate control blowing on me. I got the latest version of MyLink with a five-day weather forecast. <laughs> really quick that was not full throttle it really makes a racket when you floor it it really is like yeah we're gonna do this and you're gonna hear every little bit of it but the thing is there's about four Corvettes you have to avoid before getting to this one so if you've made the decision to get a ZR1 you're not like oh it's too loud you, you this you don't nobody buys this car on accident okay I'm trying to roll on in here <laughs> Oh my God. Well, now, something I didn't realize is that a shift light comes on when you get pretty close. However, you're going so damn fast, you can't react. I mean, if I had pulled the paddle when I first saw the shift light, it wouldn't have mattered. I still would have hit the top. It's too fast. <laughs> oh my God, it's just amazing. I mean, this feels as fast as any supercar I've ever driven. It doesn't quite feel as fast as, as 918, but I mean, even to make that comparison shows kind of what we're talking about here. God, even just a little bit of throttle, that sound. It's like, it's like the world is ending. It's like there's a, a thunderstorm has just appeared in your ear. The steering is quite precise. The very initial turn-in is not quite as precise as, as some the European and Italian exotics. But after that, it feels just as precise and it just stays completely flat. And listening to the, I mean, I'm shifting, listening to the, the engine going up, down, that's one of the great treats. It doesn't feel like Miata tight. When I drove the GT350R, I was surprised at how tight it felt. You couldn't use it on like tiny, like an autocross. This doesn't quite feel like that. I mean, that's, that's as fast as any car most people will ever drive ever. Um, that's, that's not too far off the pace of the hypercar P1. Yeah, it's a Corvette. Th and, you know, I've driven the old ZR1, and it wasn't anything close to like this. This is the, just the next level of insane. The old ZR1 was fast, and it felt fast, and it felt like I don't know, a freight train amount of power. But this thing is the whole package. You got the you got the exhaust. We already know it, what it can do on the track. The old ZR1 was quiet. This thing has the look of just a much more insane car. This is this is the Corvette. And so that's the 2019 Chevy Corvette ZR1. Now, I admit I've never been a huge Corvette fan, but it's impossible not to love this thing. And while everyone would agree that $140,000 is no longer cheap like prior fast Corvette models have been, it's still a bargain when you consider that it beats most supercars in most categories. And now it's time to give it a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the ZR1 looks cool, but the Corvette design is a little familiar, and I've always felt the C7 was a little too much of a simple evolution of the C6, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Acceleration, it does 0 to 60 in 3 seconds, so it gets a 9 out of 10. Handling is very sharp, and it easily earns an 8 out of 10. Cool factor is high, as this is the hottest new Corvette, and everyone's very excited about it right now, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Finally, there's importance. The ZR1 is important in the sense that it's the ultimate Corvette, but if we know anything about the Corvette world, we know that it won't hold that title for too long, and it gets a 7 out of 10. That brings the weekend score to 38 out of 50, ahead of the Dodge Demon, the Chevy Camaro ZL1, and the Corvette Z06. No surprise. As for the daily categories, starting with features, the ZR1 has a lot of goodies, but it stops short of much of the latest modern tech, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Comfort, it isn't really, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Quality is fine, though there's still more plastic than you'd like, especially as prices start to approach $150,000, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Practicality is decent, it has a surprising amount of cargo room, but only two seats, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Finally, there's value, and it's hard to deny this is a great one. Yeah, it's expensive, but it's a bargain compared to other 
cars with similar numbers, and it gets a 9 out of 10, bringing the total daily score to 27 out of 50, lagging behind the Dodge Demon and the Camaro ZL1. Also no surprise, as those are larger, more comfortable, more practical cars with back seats. Add it all together, and the Doug score is 65 out of 100, which is good. Here's a comparison. The Demon barely beats it out. The Demon's a little more practical and more comfortable and a little faster, but otherwise the ZR1 beats out all the latest American performance models. Still, it lags a bit behind the European supercars as they have higher quality interiors and more breathtaking styling. Then again, those cars had better beat out the ZR1 considering they tend to cost about twice as much. ZR1 badge on either side of the hood actually blocks your... The coolest part is that they sort of curve in in the middle of the car, presumably so. The other interesting thing about the cargo area and the rear wing is the fact that the rear wing is something or other. Oh yeah. 